Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. Yo, it's your boy, the odd guy himself, Malik King Scott. Hi, I'm Charlie Edwards. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Coastman. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 38 of the Box Hard Podcast. I'm your host, Joey Coastman. I'm joined, as always, by Ayaz Sumra. Ayaz, how you doing? I'm good, Joey. How are you? Very good, very good. Same old, same old. This show is number 38. We've done 37 previous shows and we've brought you 75 guests, some reoccurring, admittedly. But again, 75 guests in 37 shows. As I said in one of the earlier shows, we we aim to bring you two guests per show. Sometimes we've brought you three. Sometimes we've brought you four. Sometimes we've brought you none. It really has been up and down, up and down. There's not too much to review in part one here. Of course, part one consists of the review part, and then we usually bring on a first guest. So there's really not much to review. Something that I want to just suggest to you, Ayaz, um, I know that we've talked before about bringing in like a prediction league kind of thing. We're not going to predict fights every week, but just the big fights. If we put a prediction down, and maybe you can keep the chart, and we can have somewhat of like a little score. I think we can maybe have a bet of of about two pence and um and we we'll see who ends up winning it after I don't know after when we get to episode 50 or something we we'll see who's in who's in the lead but do you mind keeping the scores on that you know if we predict a couple of fights here and there the big fights of course we're going to predict a couple on this show yeah that'd be good yeah bring a bit of excitement in um also I just wanted to point out that I think from now we're actually going to start because there's a load of crazy names for boxers and I don't mean nicknames smoking joe frazier type names i mean some really crazy names that boxers are listed as um so i think from now on every single week when we do a show we're gonna we're gonna make it part of part one we're gonna talk about the craziest name that we've seen who's fighting in that week okay so there was a couple of crazy names last week but we're not going to include them we're going to start with the crazy names that are fighting this week. I'm only going to bring you one per week. I'm going to really try and dig through all the fights. And what we're going to do is we're actually going to talk about that fight. You know, we don't know nothing about most of these crazy name fighters, but we're going to mention their fight and we're going to let you know the result next week. And hopefully next week, we'll be able to tell you about a new crazy fight or crazy fighter's name coming up on that weekend. So this week, I've definitely, I've looked through all the fights that's taking place. And on the Saturday, I must say, the craziest one I've come across has to be a guy in the Philippines, a Filipino guy, and his name is Honey Boy Padillo. And I'm not joking. You can go and look it up. His name is Honey Boy Padillo. He changed his name to Honey Boy. It wasn't, that wasn't his birth name. He had some um, some Filipino birth name, but he's changed his name to Honey Boy Padillo. So at the moment, his record is 1-0. and oh. He's having a four-round fight. He's a light flyweight, and he's fighting a guy who's only had one fight, and it was a loss, in Jeffrey Claro. So next week, we'll update you to let you know if Honey Boy Padillo has remained undefeated in his second professional bout. Anyway, that's it. For the crazy names, we're now going to go into the review. There's really not much to review. As I said, the first fight that we're going to talk about happened over in Chicago, Illinois. Top of the bill, Juan Carlos Payano. He fought a rematch against Roche Warren. Payano 17 and 0 going into this fight. Warren 13 and 1. That one loss coming to Payano. This was for Payano's WBA Super World Bantamweight title and the IBO World Bantamweight title. Not not a lot of people credit that belt there. Anyway, it came down to a majority decision. Roche Warren got the majority decision win. So Payano now 17 and 1. And Roche Warren has wrote that. I think that's the saying. He's 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 wrote the wrong, and um, he's he's you know he's he's come back off the blemish and defeated the guy that defeated him. So he's wrote that wrong. That's what it is. And uh, Warren now the new WBA Super World Bantamweight title. So this will be one that Jamie McDonald would have paid a close eye to. And I know that he'll be he'll be gunning for Warren now. And I think he's he could beat Warren. But the fight itself, it was it was a strange fight. It was kind of like turning in the tides. 
a lot during the fight. Payano was coming forward a lot. Uh, Warren was... It, it really wasn't an impressive fight. There's a lot of decent fights at Bantamweight, you know, the, the smaller guys. But this one really wasn't a fantastic fight. But like I say, Warren, it's, it's a good win for him. And on that undercard, a serious, serious shock. A real big upset. A lot of people saying it's the biggest upset of 2016 Andre Fonfara defending his WBC international light heavyweight title. As I said on last week's show, he kind of made his name from losing to Adonis Stevenson. He fought Joe Smith Jr., who had a record of 21-1, and hadn't really fought any great names or anything like that. We hadn't really heard of him. And Fonfara started the fight pretty well, started the round pretty well, should I say, in round one. Um, you know, came out, he, he looked to sort of tag... Joe Smith with a couple of shots. I wasn't sure what was going on. And he threw a flurry of punches. And Joe Smith just threw a counter overhand right. And it put Fonfara down. Now he got up pretty much, you know, with a couple of seconds after being knocked down. He got up. He wasn't down for too long. And his legs just sort of carried him into the ropes. He, they kind of ran into the ropes. Like he didn't, you know, his legs didn't really know what they were doing. He, you know, and... um yeah, like I say, he got up, he, his legs made him run into the ropes, and then the referee sort of gave him the benefit of the doubt and did let it carry on, and about 10 seconds later, he was on the deck again, and yeah, it went down as a TKO for for Joe Smith Jr., so a good win for him, and from Farah, I don't really want to be too quick to write him off. I think he's I think he is a good fighter, he's proved that against Adonis Stevenson and Nathan Cleverly, etc., but... I don't, I don't know if he was just caught cold or it was just a good counter punch. I don't know, but we didn't really get to see too much. So I don't know if Joe Smith Jr. is the next big thing, or you know, was it just a fluke? We don't know. So very, very strange fight. But like I say, a big, big upset. And the only other fight that I'm going to mention happened over in Lewiston in USA. Steve Collins Jr. successfully moved to eight and zero. With the one draw, he picked up a unanimous decision win after six rounds in the cruiserweight division. His opponent, Jose Humberto Coral. Anyway, that's it for the very, very short review part of the show. Before we end part one, we're going to bring on our first guest. Okay, our first guest on this week's show is fighting on the Joshua undercard on Saturday against Chris Eubank Jr. It's none other than Mr. Tom Doran. Tom, welcome to the show. Hello, and thanks for having me on here. My pleasure, my pleasure. First things first, um, how are you doing on this day? Fantastic. Um, it's actually my last day of training today, so I'm looking forward to winding down and recharging the batteries for Saturday night after after today. Absolutely. Now, you've gathered a 17-0 and record yourself. Very good record, undefeated, of course, including especially the last fight, which was a brilliant fight to watch while it lasted. You're putting it all on the line against Chris Eubank Jr. How are you feeling just a few days before fight night now? Great. I do genuinely feel great. You know, um, it's a massive fight for me. Massive, massive platform events, uh, whatever you like to call it. And I'm just looking forward to, you know, soaking all that up this weekend and, you know, putting on a great performance at the O2. Now, you're a big underdog. Um, Eubank is being lined up with the Golovkin fight, but obviously he's got to get past you to get there. Is it a good thing that he's kind of overlooking you a little bit from from your point of view? Yeah, definitely. The more the, the more distraction, the better, I believe. And look, I've I've never had concerns at all about upsetting the apple cart. You know, other people's plans don't factor into my plans. Obviously, in the last fight, it was it was an up-and-down fight. It was, it, was, it was very exciting to watch, as I said. Um, obviously, you were put down by Aquila. Now, knowing about the, the you know, the punch ferociousness that, that Eubank brings to the table, how confident are you that you'll be able to, you know, go to dip walk go to deep water and swim. But not only that, but you're coming off of four knockouts yourself. Do you feel that your power's underrated as well? Do you reckon there's going to be a knockout in this fight? I do, yeah, definitely. And and like I say, how confident are you? You know, he throws a lot of hard punches, a lot of fast punches, as we've seen, obviously, you know, horrible stuff in the Nick Blackwell fight. Um, you know, how confident are you that you can you can go to deep I'm water confident. and swim? I mean, he does, he does throw a lot of punches, but at stationary targets, 
you know, you can look at the videos in training. It's easy to throw a lot of punches and hard punches. It's just repetitive. Same punch, same punch, same punch, same punch. Um, you know, and it, the pads don't move. Okay, okay. Um, have you watched any of the Billy Joe Saunders fight and taken anything from I that have, that you're going to bring yeah. into it? Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm glad to hear yeah, you I've, say I've that. Watched, I've watched a few of the fights. You know, obviously, I wouldn't discuss a game plan with anyone, but yeah, I've, I've watched enough. And in terms of, you know, the the time that this fight has come around, do you feel that would you have liked this fight perhaps in a few months' time, or do you reckon it's the perfect time for this fight? Perfect. There's, there's plenty of distraction on the, you know, in the other camp. Um, not that I need that because I, I, you know, I'd be, I'd be expecting a, you know, 100% Chris Eubank Jr. Um, as he'll be getting a 110% Tom Doran. Um, but yeah, I think time is perfect. And how much would it mean to you and Welsh boxing for you to, you know, to, to win that title and bring the, the British title back to Wales? I think that, I believe if you win this fight, you'll be the second, um, the second man from the north of Wales to win the title. I believe so, yeah. So, obviously, that would be massive. You know, Wales did great in the football last night. We'll make it a, make it a double this weekend. <laughs> Absolutely. Do you watch now? Do you watch? Do you watch the sport of boxing much, Tom? And if you do, who's your favourite fighter to watch at the moment? Uh, favourite fighter to watch? Um, it would have to be a toss-up between Golovkin and Lomachenko. Do you sort of hold Golovkin at the top of the pile in the middleweight division in in the world terms? Yeah, at this moment in time, definitely. Who would you like to see Golovkin face in the near future as his next fight? Would you like to see that Canelo fight or? Oh, absolutely! Yeah, I mean that would be a great fight. I, I love Canelo as well. Um, I don't know how I would call that, to be honest, but I think it'd be a cracking fight. Now, um, just before I let you go, Tom, I just wanted to give you a chance to to thank any sponsors or anyone that you want to thank in general. Just I want to give you that airtime. So, uh, if there's anyone to thank, please go ahead. Yeah, well, I'd, I'd like to thank um, AJ Field Electrical Mechanical. You know, he's been he's been a sponsor for a long time now. Uh, Keystone Property, um, Signatures Restaurants, Shaka the Bucky Smacker, uh, Corbett's Bucky's. Um, the sponsors have come come on board on this fight, definitely. You know, um, and you know, I'm grateful to all of those. Also, the whole of North Wales, and you know, and beyond that, for just the amount of support, uh, messages of you know good wishes. Um, you know, the support has been unreal for this fight and I, you know, I can't thank them all enough and I'll be putting on a great performance for them all Saturday night. Absolutely. A lot of people backing you in this one, Tom. Listen, I wish you the absolute best of luck. I really, really hope you can go out there and give it the 110% and, and, and do the business on the night, Tom. Brilliant. All right. Thank you very much for thanks giving us a bit of time. time. Thanks. Bye now. Okay. Now it's time for part two on this week's show. This part, of course, the preview part where we preview the fights that are taking place this weekend. We also bring in a guest and we also bring you the news. Ayaz, I know you've got a juicy piece of news for us. So just to start part two, give us this nice bit of news that we've been waiting to hear for quite a while now. Sergei Kovalev is set to defend his world light heavyweight titles against Andre Ward in Las Vegas on November 19th. Oh, oh, oh. Everybody that we've spoke to on this show that that are in the light heavyweight division, I've asked them about this fight, including someone we spoke to, I think it was on last week's show. Yeah, it was. Who did we speak to last week? It was a light heavyweight. Um, Anthony Yard. Yeah, Anthony Yard. We, I asked him about that fight. So I'm very, very happy to know that it's now officially on yeah, so it's on on November the 19th. I, as this is a proper fight, isn't it? This really is. Well, I don't want to say brawler against boxer because I know that Kovalev's got very underrated boxing skills himself, but this really is the ultimate fight, isn't it? This really is where we're going to see how good Kovalev is or how good Ward is. To be honest, we're both going to see. Co- you know, Co- Ward is, is almost like the undisputed pound-for-pound pound king when he was active. Mayweather was there on top of him, but Mayweather's now hung up the gloves unofficially, officially, who knows? And um, it'll be interesting to see this. This re- this is one of them fights you just can't miss. 
Um, it's you know I know that we've had a lot of them lately. These fights that you can't miss, but it's fantastic. You know we've you know that Pacquiao Mayweather fight this year. We're getting that. I don't know if it's up there with with this on the same sort of level as that, but. To me and to a lot of the other hardcore boxing fans, I think it is. How how interested are you to see this fight? How excited are you to see this fight, Ayaz? I'm looking forward for this fight because obviously Andre Ward, in my opinion, I reckon he's pound for pound and he's obviously a very technical and very good boxer. And obviously we've seen Kovalev just knock out Pascal in his last fight, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Knocked him here twice now. He's knocked out yeah, Pascal. And, and it's one monster versus a technical boxer, which in my opinion is a very good fight. Yeah, hopefully it shapes up that way. But yeah, Kovalev, oh boy, I I actually, do you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna do a prediction on that. It's it's quite a long way away. It's in November, but I am actually picking Kovalev to win that. I as I actually am picking Kovalev, whether that shocks you or not. I've been I've I've had him for quite a while. I've thought if this fight gets made, I've got Kovalev. I've had that opinion for a few months now. What do you think? I'm gonna go for a Ward win. Ward win on points. Okay, well, we'll see close to the time, and uh, and and um, hopefully I'm I'm winning in the in the prediction league by then, and hopefully I win again. <laughs> but we'll be, we'll see. At the minute, it's it's nil nil, so we're gonna get in some predictions very shortly. We're gonna start the preview part of the show with a strange old fight happening on Friday over in China. Get a load of this one, Ayers. Ian Lewison fighting in China. This is for the WBO Asia Pacific heavyweight title. He's fighting a guy called Z Yu Wu, who has a record of seven and O. It's a strange one, I isn't it? Yes, definitely it is. So uh, Ian Lewis and from Brixton traveling over to uh, to China. This is I don't really understand. There's a lot of mad fights, you know, like strange fights that have happened in strange places, and this certainly is up there with some of the most recent ones for sure. Also in China on that same night over in Beijing, China at the Capital Gym, Javier Fortuna defends his WBA World Super Featherweight title against Jason Sosa, Javier Fortuna. 29 and 0 with the one draw. Jason Sosa 18 and 1 with four draws. This will be a good fight. I'm looking forward to see what happens here. And also on that undercard, Jun Ki Kao is fighting Nohomar Semeno. Apologies on both parts for the bad pronunciation. This is for the vacant WBA World Super Bantamweight title. So that will be interesting. That's the one that Scott Quigg held and then lost to. Carl Frampton and then Carl Frampton relinquished it while he moved up to face Leo Santa Cruz. So that one's up for grabs there. And it's, it's strange to see that fight happen in Beijing. So um, a couple of good fights there from relatively, relatively unknown fighters. Jun Kil Kao has a record of 20 wins and two losses. Nehumar Samerno has a record of 23 wins, five losses and one draw. So, um, my bet is that whoever wins this won't be a champion for a long, long, long time. Um, OK, that's it for China. We're now going to come back to the UK over in Glasgow, Scotland. Just wanted to let everybody know that Gary Cornish is back in action. He has a record of 22 wins and one loss. His opponent yet to be announced. That's it for Scotland. We're now going to go over to... Belgium friend of the show Joe Fournier he looks to move to 5 and 0 oh. this bout's only a four rounder it's a super middleweight his opponent is having his 40th professional fight on the night so could it be an upset could it be a big win and a big 40 uh, Joe Fournier of course 4 and 0 oh at the moment so it's good to get in there with these vastly experienced guys it's it's really good it's, it's experience that money can't buy and we wish Joe Fournier all the best just thought we'd point that out to our listeners that he's back out again in Belgium. Um, that's it for Belgium. We're now going to go over to the big one on Saturday night, O2 Arena, London, United Kingdom. We're going to start with the undercard. We're going to start with Felix Cash, the new matchroom signing. He's making his debut in a four rounder at middleweight against Yelton Neves, who has a record of zero wins, one loss, zero draws. So Felix Cash, will, it'll be interesting. I hope that his fight's televised because I want to see how good. He is in the professional ranks. Also on that bill, Ted Cheeseman. He faces Danny Little. It's a six-rounder at welterweight. Ted Cheeseman looking to move to 5-0, and oh, a promising prospect. Connor Ben is also on the bill. He looks to move to 3-0. and oh. 
He's in a four-rounder. I want to see his fight as well. Also on this bill, Cal Yafai, 18-0 and at the moment, looking to move to 19-0. and His opponent yet to be announced at the moment. Anthony Agogo also on the bill, looking to move to 10-0. and Six-rounder at middleweight, his fight. He faces a guy with a record of 11 wins and two losses by the name of Frain Radnich. Also on the bill... Dillian White, the body snatcher, looking to move to 17 professional wins. He's got the one loss to Anthony Joshua. It's a six-rounder at heavyweight, and he faces Danny Bachelda, who has a record of 31 wins, 11 losses, and one draw. Also on the bill, Chris Eubank Jr., Defending his British middleweight title against Tom Doran, 17 and 0. Chris Eubank Jr., 22 and 1. There's a lot of good fights in this bill. Let's let's be completely honest. Also on the bill, yet again, every single fight is a fight that I want to watch. John Wayne Hibbert, he fights for the vacant WBC Silver Super Lightweight title against Andrea Scarpa. John Wayne Hibbert, 17 and 3. Scarpa, 19 and 2. I really hope that John Wayne Hibbert can pull this win off. I really do like the guy. And I really wish him the best. And if he wins this, he creeps into a, a good ranking with the WBC at super lightweight at 140. So he might even end up on the world stage if he gets through this in a, in a few months' time. Also on the bill, George Groves against Martin Murray. Everybody knows this is the fight of the night. It's for the WBA International Super Middleweight title, the title that Groves currently holds. It's, of course, at super middleweight. Ayaz, how do you see this fight going? It's this really is a big fight. We had Paddy Fitzpatrick on the show last week, the former trainer of George Groves. He was saying, you know, it's a straight down the middle 50-50 fight. George Groves, not the best at fighting inside. Martin Murray, that's one of his strongest things in his arsenal. So what do you what do you think about this fight, Ayers? Whoever loses the fight, in my opinion, will retire, I reckon. Personally, I'm going to go for a George Groves win. And, if this, and, and by George Groves win, it's going to be a points win. So it's a make or break fight. Yeah, I mean, I, I hope that, I mean, a lot of people are tipping George Groves to win. I hope that if he does win, Martin Murray doesn't retire because it's a lot of middleweights retiring recently, if you haven't noticed, from the UK. Of course, a couple of years back, Darren Barker, he retired. He was a middleweight. Then we've lost recently Matthew Macklin. He's gone as well. And Martin Murray, although he's now campaigning at super middle, he's been a middleweight for for you know, for the most most part of his career, so it'd be a shame to lose three guys all relatively, you know, on that world on that world stage kind of thing. So it's a shame for Martin Murray. Martin Murray is one of the most unluckiest boxers in British boxing right now. You know, he's he's had a couple of world title bids that have gone the wrong way on the night due to being due to you know the fight taking place in in the champions back garden but this really is a 50 50 we're gonna we're gonna i'm gonna press you for a prediction here i as i know that you know we don't really like to predict on these 50 50 fights because it really divides the divides people i hope that we don't get a bunch of haters for doing this but who do you see winning this because i tell you what a part of me really thinks martin murray but i think I'm going to have to go with Groves. I'm just worried about his engine, man, because Martin Murray keeps coming for the whole 12 rounds. Ayers, talk to me. I'm going to go for a George Groves win on points. Yeah, I don't see anybody getting knocked out. There's no way I can see George Groves knocking Martin Murray out. I can't see... Oh, do you know what? I, I think if there was going to be a knockout, I think, oh, Murray don't really hit hard enough. It's, it's, it's such a toss-up fight. It really, really is. Obviously, uh, Martin Murray went 11 rounds with Golovkin, which was quite impressive. You know, he knocks everybody out much earlier than that. George Groves was sparring Golovkin. There's a lot of rumours around that. Who really knows what happened? But this was... This is this is going to be a really good fight. This is the one I'm looking forward to the most. And top of the bill, of course, Anthony Joshua, the current IBF World Heavyweight Champion. He puts his belt on the line against undefeated Olympian Dominic Brazil. Both guys undefeated as pros. Both guys Olympians. Anthony Joshua, 16-0. and 0. Dominic Brazil, 17-0. and 0. Ayaz, how do you see this fight going? I'm going to go for a Joshua knockout. I personally, this is the reason because I have I haven't much seen of Brazil, and obviously we've seen Joshua knocking out all of his fights he's had. It's all been knockout, so everyone knows more. I personally know more about Joshua than Brazil, so I'm, that's why I'm going to go for a Joshua win. Okay, okay. Um, I I know a little bit about Brazil. I know that 
he fought um, Amir Mansour and looked looked gassed after a couple of rounds, to be honest. And it really wasn't impressive, even though he got the win. And, and Mansour was about 42 when they fought. So Joshua's just, it's, it's a bit of a mismatch. He's too big. He's too strong. He's too active. He's too fit. And I think he's going to be hitting too hard on the night. I can see a stoppage here for Anthony Joshua. Um, I'd like to see Brazil test him. I'm not hating on Joshua when I say that. I would like to see him tested. We just have not seen him get hit at all in all 17, in all 16 fights. And I think it's going to be in all 17. I really hope we see Brazil test him and land something on him. Obviously, Dillian White did. He just didn't jump on him at that moment. Dillian White put up a really good account of himself, actually. And yeah, so, so Anthony Joshua, yeah, I think that I, as I know that we're talking about doing this prediction league, but I don't think there's anything that we don't agree on here. I think a Joshua knockout... We both. I'm, I'm going to go. I'm going to go with you on George Groves on points. So yeah, I think that we, we're agreeing on everything here. I'm I'm going with Dillian White over his opponent. The other guys fairly, you know, they're in their fights to win them pretty easily. The uh, the prospects like Conor Ben, etc. So I think we can't be split on this one. But that's it for the UK. We're now going to go over to the USA. Just a fight I want to mention over in Louisiana. Prospect Devin Haney. He gets out again. Promising lightweight to look out for. He looks to move to 7-0. He fights Clay Burns, who has a winning record of four wins, one loss, and two draws. So, again... Devin Haney, this fight won't be televised or anything like that, but definitely look out for that name. I know he's just landed a big sponsor, I think, with Reebok. I don't want to get that wrong. I hope I hope I got that right. But yeah, promising young guy. He's only 17 and he's really, really making waves already. That's it for Louisiana. We're now going to go over to the big one happening over at the Barclays Centre, Brooklyn, New York. To be honest, it's not a fantastic undercard, but... Two fights I want to mention on the bill. Firstly, I'm going to start with the co-main event. Jarrett Hurd, 17-0. and 0. He faces Oscar Molina, 13-0 and 0 with one draw. This is up at Super Welter, and this is a 10-rounder. Both guys undefeated. Somebody's O has to go. And now the main event, Keith Furman. 26 and 0. He puts his WBA World Welterweight title on the line against Sean Porter, 26 and 1 with one draw. That one loss coming to our very own Kel Brook. Ayaz, this is a fight that we've been waiting for for a long time. I think it was first scheduled for March. I think that it was Keith Furman who who injured himself and it was postponed. It might it might have been Porter actually. I can't remember to be honest, but this is finally happening. It's here. It's happening on the weekend. This really is a 50-50 fight, Ayaz. How do you see this one going? Yes, obviously, the fight goes postponed because Keith Furman was in a car crash, right? P- Porter, we know, is a very good fighter, right? And so is Keith Furman. Obviously, Keith Furman has voted to knock Porter out within the first eight runs. And obviously, I like Porter, but I like Furman as well. But so, uh, I'm going to go for a Furman win. And they say the, if Furman wins this fight, we could see Furman and Brook in a future fight. I believe the winner is actually supposed to be, uh, I think, David Avanessian, who we had on the show just before he beat Shane Mosley. He is in position because he's the interim WBA champion of the world. So he's in position to fight the winner of this fight. So I want to see that fight because I believe in David Avanessian. I think he's a really good fighter and um, he's, he's going to be making waves soon. And he's already made waves, to be totally honest. So I want to see him against the winner. And perhaps the winner of that could fight Kelbrook. I know that David Evanesian actually broke one of Kelbrook's ribs in sparring. So, um, I mean, it's only sparring. It's, you know, it's, fights are not won in sparring. But that would be a good fight. I do want to see. It's, it's really hotting up in the 147 division without the, you know, with the absence of Mayweather. So it's it's interesting to see what's unfolding here. But I think... Oh, it's a tough one again. I can I can see both guys winning it. I can see both guys winning it. I can see Sean Porter winning. Do you think it's going to be a knockout or points? I personally reckon it'll go to points. Yeah, I think it's probably a points fight as well. But Sean Porter just comes relentlessly. Do you know what? I can see Sean Porter. I'm going to go against you just to make it just to make it interesting so we've got something to keep a score on here. I'm going to go with Sean Porter to win this fight. Part of me, actually, I, I think that Keith Furman's going to win, but I'm actually going to go with 
Sean Porter, just to make it interesting, Sean Porter's going to beat Keith Furman. We'll see. So you keep the scores on that one, Ayaz, and we'll find out next week. We're both going with points. So I'm going with Porter points. You're going with Furman points. We'll see who comes out victorious on that one. And also, over in the Bomb Factory, Dallas, Texas, USA, Matt Korobov returns to the ring to face Brian Vera over eight rounds at super middleweight this one. Matt Korobov, 25-1, and one, that one loss devastating loss to Andy Lee. I remember watching that one. That was a big, big knockout. One of those punches from the gods that Andy Lee manages to find when he's losing fights. And Brian Vera has a record of 23 wins and 10 losses. I think this is going to be a comfortable win for Matt Korobov, to be honest. Also on this bill, Mike Malhai Alvarado, 35 and 4. Everybody knows who he is. He's fighting in an eight rounder at welterweight against Josh Torres, who has a record of 15 wins and four losses with two draws. Also on that bill, Eric De Leon, 12 and 0. He faces Carlos Vacastle, 14 and 7 with four draws. And that's really it for the previewing on this week's show. We're now going to welcome our second and final guest. Our second guest on this week's show is a very special guest. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome former Olympic gold medalist, former light heavyweight and heavyweight champion of the world. It's Mr. Michael Spinks. Michael, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks a lot. No problem. No problem. My pleasure. Firstly, Michael, I do want this interview to be, you know, based mainly on your career. That's the reason we got you on the show. But before we get into that, there's nowhere there's nowhere else really to start than the very sad news the boxing world received a couple of weeks ago, the passing of the great Muhammad Ali. I know you and your brother have memories with Ali. What's your reaction to this loss? Well, you know, Leon fought him, so I, I, I really didn't have a chance to really, uh, really get into into in Muhammad Ali, but he fought Leon, and Leon uh, was a great, big, a uh, big fan of Muhammad. I was a big fan of Muhammad Ali, so. Uh, but Leon beat him. Leon beat him, so Leon was a little more familiar with him than that, than myself. But I always did. Uh, I, I sat with him on a number of occasions, and uh, he's a really funny. He's a really funny and fun, fun-loving man. So I, that's what I remember a lot about him. Absolutely. I just wanted to touch on your brother, Leon. How is he now health-wise? Leon's doing pretty good. Okay, that's good to hear. He's healthy. He's healthy. He's healthy. Yeah, that's good to hear. That's good to hear. Okay, let's get into your career. Tell us how the journey started, Michael, in a nutshell, how it all began from your first time that you stepped into a ring as an amateur up until the point you turned pro. Just quickly sum that up for us, please. Well, 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 I... I, uh... Well, Leon uh, went to the gym first. Leon came home and said, Mike, I went to the gym. You know, uh, I was um, the third family member. Leon Leon was born first, my sister, then myself. So Leon, I think uh, we got picked on a lot. You know, so Leon, some guys took Leon to the gym. Uh, the Westbrook brothers, they took Leon to the gym. Leon came home and said, Mike, I went to the gym. So the next day, the very next day, I, I like, you know, because I was a little crazy, and I tried to fight Leon. Leon whooped some of his stuff on me. So the very next day after that, I <laughs> went to the gym. The very okay. next day. So therefore, you know, uh, you know, I, I, I was learning how to fight as Leon was learning how to fight. And, uh, you know, it, it, it was really, really spectacular in, uh, in, in that instance of, of learning how to fight as Leon did, too. So, uh it, it was great. It was great. It was a great uh, 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 learning experience, and I uh, learned as well as Leon. But Leon learned a lot faster than myself, and I always kind of like not envy, but I admired uh, just how fast Leon learned how to fight. We had a great, great coach, and the first coach was uh, um, uh, Jim Merrill was his name, and he was teaching us how to fight. Uh, I mean, speed. He taught us speed. He taught us, you know, how to bob and weave. I mean, he was a good teacher. So that 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 was the, the top or the very beginning of our our learning experience. Yeah, absolutely. Now, as I said, you you had an illustrious amateur career, winning the gold medal as well. You turned pro in 1977, weighing in around. 
168, which nowadays is a super middleweight limit. How many super middleweights nowadays could move up to heavyweight and win a world title? None is the answer. In your 17th professional fight, you challenged Eddie Mustafa Mohammed for the WBA light heavyweight world title, which was your first professional 15-round fight. Tell us about that fight, Michael. Well, you know, Eddie Mustafa was a, was one hell of a he was one hell heck of a a a, a puncher. He was a puncher. You know, so anyway, I, I did believe that I could beat him, and I stayed in a a a, a, a clubhouse in in the Catskills uh, of, of New York, and you know, I always, for some reason, I uh, followed the seven because I was born seven twenty two fifty six, so you know, I always just you know felt that uh, a seven was on my side. So when I fought Eddie Mustafa, I stayed in a hotel, I mean, not a hotel, but a clubhouse, uh, a, a golf clubhouse where it was a 777G. So I just didn't pay no attention to that. You know, and then I said, well, let me see what, 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 what number is F, is, is, is the, the, the letter G in the alphabet. So I looked it up like later on as I, you know, trained and trained and trained. And I looked it up. You know, and, 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 and G, the letter G is the seventh, is the seventh letter in the alphabet. So I'm like, oh, I have four or seven. So I, I, I believed in that. And when I fought Eddie Mustafa, I thought that I would beat him because of the sevens. And, and, and I did. I did beat him. And I, uh, I fought him well, knocked him down, and I was happy about that. Yeah, I but can imagine. The seven 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 G was uh what was was a great uh, uh omen for me where just in you know, I believe in the seven and they came through for me, that's all I gotta say about that. They came through for me, so I won with the seven 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 G. Uh in other words I had I had four seven uh that I was depending on and, and when I fought Eddie Mustafa. But I knew he was a tough opponent, so I mean, I just, I just did the best I could to beat him, and I, and I won. Yeah, but a fantastic fight to look back on. And it will be 35 years next month since you won that first title from Eddie Mustafa Mohammed. Now, you successfully defended your your title five times after that fight. You won all of those fights by knockout. Then you meet Dwight Mohammed Kawi. You hold the WBA light heavyweight title. He holds the WBC light heavyweight title. You fight to unify the titles. Tell us about this fight, because, of course, you won this fight after 15 rounds again by um, unanimous decision. How is this? How is this fight for you looking back now? It was a great fight, you know. And uh, people don't know that when Braxton, when Dwight Braxton, which Muhammad Kwawe, when he come out of prison, when he was in prison, I think he come out of prison, he come to Joe Frazier's gym. I used to box Braxton every day, and I used to whoop his ass. Excuse my friend. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's okay. That's okay on this show. <laughs> and uh, he would try to be slick. And hit me, and hit me with like an overhead punch. But I was hip to his style, and every time he tried to be slick, I would really like pepper up. I, mean, I would pepper him with a, a lot of punches, and he would get mad because I would go on his ass. Cause he, but he tried to be slick and hit me with a sucker punch. So anyway, me and Braxton became good friends. He's a friend of mine right now, and I whooped his ass a lot. And you can tell him that he'll get mad and say I didn't, but. I whooped his ass a lot, and he <laughs> and he, he became one of my sparring partners. I took on the road with me for a couple of fights, and so but Braxton was a, a a real tough guy to spar with. I had a good time sparring with him, but I whooped his ass a lot. And then when he tried to be slick, and on it, uh, I, I, we were finish around, and, and, and him going back to his corner, I would kick him in the ass. <laughs> With my with the side of my foot because he tried to be slick, but I caught him in his game, and uh, we had a good time. Me and Braxton had a good time. I, I I love Braxton. Me and Braxton had a good times boxing and sparring together. And I taught him. I taught. I think I taught him how to fight <laughs> because after he left me, he became a champ. Absolutely. But I whooped his ass a lot. I whooped his ass a whole lot. <laughs> yeah, you made that. I know you can tell that he ain't gonna never admit to that. 
But, but I whooped his ass a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anyone's ever said he that word so many it. times. <laughs> yeah, he can tell. He can tell. You. He, he know. He know it. You know it. <laughs> then you well, defend. We had a good time for our being together. Yeah, of course. Then you defend both your WBA and WBC world titles for the first time and get another knockout, this time over an undefeated fighter. You then go on to fight Eddie Davis for the IBF. And, well, the IBF had just started their organization back then, so they put the belt on the line, if I'm not mistaken. So three world titles were up That's for right. grabs. You pick up the win and the vacant IBF title. You become the first light heavyweight to hold the IBF title and you retain all three of the belts. You go on to defend your title twice against two undefeated fighters, both 16 and 0. You win both of those fights by knockout. Now, at this point, you've had a wonderful career. You're 27 and 0. You're the undisputed light heavyweight champion of the world, but you do the unthinkable and move up to heavyweight. You jump straight into a world title fight with undefeated IBF heavyweight champion and one of the best heavyweights ever, Larry Holmes. Now, his record at the time is 48 and 0. He's beaten Ken Norton, he's beaten Muhammad Ali, he's beaten your brother Leon, Trevor Burbick, you name it. He also weighs about over 40 pounds more than anyone you've ever fought at this point. Michael, tell us what happened in this fight. Well, you know, when I had to fight Larry, you know, I had a guy, a nutritionist that would help me. He said, I can help you uh, do that, Mike. So I, uh, I let him help me. And uh, what I thought about beating was my nutritionist. He only weighed 135 pounds. So I said, look, I don't suppose to beat Larry Holmes. Everybody says I, 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 can't, I can't beat him because, you know, I, and nobody has never done that. So what I thought about was beating my nutritionist. And I said, if I beat him, the fight with Larry Holmes should be a cinch because this guy only weighs 135 pounds. So I thought about beating my nutritionist first. And I thought that fighting Larry would be a cinch because... If I can beat this 135-pound fighter, I mean, not fighter, but nutritionist, I knew that if I fought when I fought Larry, I'd be in good shape for, for fighting Larry. So anyway, that's what I thought about. That was my mindset. So when I got in the ring with Larry, I found out, you know, that uh, I, was a little, I was a little afraid, afraid but I fought, when I got in the ring with Larry, I, I thought about what I did with the nutritionist, my, 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 my friend, Mac and Shieldstone. So I thought I would do well if I did well with him. And and that's what I thought about. So when I got in the ring with Larry, I saw Larry was a little, you know, a little afraid to come on with the come on. So, and so in that, you know, I wasn't afraid of Larry when I got in there. So I, 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 once we got in the ring with one another, and all of a sudden I, I, I thought Larry was going to come on with the come on, but he didn't come on with the come on. He actually, he, he respected me. And when he when he respected me, I took advantage of that. I started coming on with the come on. I started pressuring him. I started putting pressure on him. I started hitting him with punches. And then I saw him, I saw him close his eyes one time when I threw punches at him. And, and, and that was the, the worst thing he could have ever done with me, close his eyes. So I just put pressure on him. And I found out that I was more experienced than Larry in the ring that night. And I whooped his ass. <laughs> Now this this fight this was the first this was the first one it went down as the biggest upset of 1985. You beat undefeated Larry Holmes. You become the second man in history to win a world title at light heavy and heavy. Um, you also get revenge for your brother as well, and you also deny Larry That's from right. matching. There you go. There you go. You said my fool. You said that I got revenge <laughs> for Leon. <laughs> you also deny Larry from matching Rocky Marciano's 49 and 0 record, which I'm sure you didn't care about. You rematch That's Larry right. three no. months later. I cared about it. I, I didn't care about. It. I don't care about my own ass. But, yeah, exactly. I, but you know, but when I when I did beat Larry, I became an Italian hero for Marciano and stopping Larry Holmes for you know breaking or tying with Rocky Marciano. You rematch Larry three months later at the same venue. You become the only man to this day to beat Larry Holmes twice. Michael, what fight was the most difficult fight for you out of the two with Holmes? We've previously had him on our show. Yeah, God bless him. He's a nice guy. Yeah, well, well, the second fight was more difficult because I did some things that I shouldn't have been doing. I was throwing like a medicine ball. And for some reason, it seemed to have, you know, really uh, tired me out, tired my arms out. 
when I did that. And I kept telling my nutritionist, but I think, you know, he had a problem with Butch, my promoter. And uh, for some reason, I think he was trying to help me lose that fight. But I wanted to fight anyway. Now, you, yeah, as you say, you won this fight um, via split decision after 15 rounds. You retain your IBF heavyweight crown. Now, you have two more fights, winning both by knockout, one in 1986 against Stefan Tangstad and one in 1987 against Jerry Cooney. We actually had Jerry Cooney on our show two weeks ago. In the Jerry Cooney fight, you had your title stripped for taking the Cooney fight instead of fighting your mandatory challenger, Tony Tucker. You fought Cooney for more money than what was offered for the Tucker fight. In in the meantime, Mike Tyson fights Tony Tucker and beats him. Now, Mike Tyson holds the WBC, WBA, and IBF heavyweight titles, but you're still considered as the lineal champion after beating Holmes. Now, the fight between you and Tyson comes round. You're 31 and 0. Mike Tyson's 34 and 0. You suffer your first loss. Talk to us about this fight, please, Michael. Well, you know, uh, I, I had a hard, I had a hard time preparing for the fight because. I have been off a long time, so really I started living like a retired man, you know. And then when the fight did come about, you know, I had you know, been living like a retired man, you know. I I I was kind of skeptical about fighting uh, a real powerful f- opponent as Tyson, but I had to go through with the fight, and I thought that I would do well against him, you know. But you know, with him being uh, the type of boxer that he was, you know. I, I, I could do it do the best I could, but, but he was a lot more equipped than I was in that particular fight, and uh, I lost. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, I just want to ask you a couple of questions about your career, because I've been, like, narrating all of it. What was the toughest fight of your career, Michael, in your opinion, looking back now? Well, the toughest fight had to be with Mike Tyson, because I didn't, I, I didn't get through that fight. You know, I, 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 didn't, I didn't get through it. I, I lost and I, I I got stopped, you know. So I, that got to be the toughest one that, uh, uh, that I fought. I also had a, a, a sec by a second pro fight. I fought a guy named uh, Luis Rodriguez or something like that, and uh, he gave me all I needed in the fight. He was he was punch for punch. He was coming back. I was hitting him with everything I had. He kept coming back, but I mean it was it was really a tough fight that I had with him. And, yeah. and that was the fight that I could say that was a tough fight, but the the, the fight that I didn't finish was with my, Mike Tyson. So I do claim that one that one as being the toughest fight of my career. That fight you mentioned there in your second pro fight, that you know those type of fights obviously shaped you up for the fighter that you became later on. You know. Yeah, for sure. Now, who was the hardest puncher you've ever shared a ring with? Not just in fighting, but maybe also in sparring. I know that you fought quite a few guys who could punch hard. Yeah, who was that? I, I can't. I can't remember. I can't remember any guy that. <laughs> Jerry I, that Cooney was, had quite a, a fair crack punch. on him. Uh, Jerry, Jerry, Cooney, Jerry Cooney was left-handed, but he fought as a right-handed. So I tried to stay away from his left hand, you know, and I did, and I did. So I, I, I pulled it off. But, yeah. but uh, I can't. Re- I can't recall. Well, I, I like uh, a guy named Pete. Was it Pete? Pete Sewer or something like that? I, a spot partner of mine. You know that was a hard puncher. Okay. But I had okay. a lot of guys that punched really hard as a, as a sparring partner. But I managed to get through all the sparring with them guys. And I, I beat most of my sparring partners up. <laughs> you, you whooped their asses, yeah? Yeah, I whooped their asses. <laughs> I, I, I was ready for them in sparring. I was ready for that because I mean, a lot of my sparring partners tried to beat me, beat, tried to beat me up, but I was ready for them. I was ready for them, and I, I performed well in sparring. I really did. Yeah. Now, what would you put down as your best performance or your best win? And and also your, the greatest moment of your career, because like I say, you've had an illustrious one, many world title fights. I mean, you were the man, and you probably still are the man. You're one of the best light heavyweights ever to lace them up. So, what would you say was your, or was it beating Holmes? Uh, you know, what was the best win for you, the best performance? Beat, for beating you? Holmes in the first, the first fight when I beat Holmes. I mean, that was you no, know, I had fun. I, I really enjoyed, and I had a good time fighting Holmes the first time, cause I had it all my way. And, and, and I never forget that. I never forget that because I, I I took Larry's heart. I made him respect me in the ring. 
and I whooped his ass, and I think I made him go along with it. Not not mind that I beat him, that I, that I whooped him in the ring that night because I did it in such style, and I, and I wasn't afraid of him that night. And I think that Larry felt good. I think, I think I, somehow I made him feel good about losing to me. But that was the best and the most fun I ever had in a fight with Larry Holmes. Yeah, and absolutely. I woke his ass. <laughs> That's your catchphrase, that one, yeah? Uh-huh. <laughs> but I had a good time. I had a good time. And he couldn't do nothing with me. He couldn't do yeah. nothing with me. Yeah. And I, and I did that I did that for Leon and myself. Yeah, of course. Now, surely hardly anyone can predict what would have happened better than you here. You fought Tyson, your brother fought Muhammad Ali. Who would have won in some sort of crazy fantasy fight if both men were in their prime, T- Tyson and Ali? Muhammad would have beat him. Yeah, I, sh- I share that opinion. Is there a reason why? Or? He had jabbed, he had jabbed, he had jabbed, the, he had jabbed the, the hell out of Tyson. Tyson wouldn't have been, wouldn't have, would not, would not have been able to get in inside of Muhammad. Muhammad would have jabbed him to death. Yeah, I agree. I him. agree. Muhammad Ali. Yeah, I'd agree. I'd agree with that a hundred percent. Now, what are you up to these days, Michael? What are you up to these days, everyday life? What does it consist of now? Well, you know, I do what I want to do. I do what I want to do. You know, I got people calling me, me all around the country, wanting me to sign autographs. So I do that. You know. I got children, I got I got a son, I got a daughter, I got two daughters, you know, and I got grandkids, so, you know, I spend a lot of my time with them. But are you enjoying life at the moment? Say it again? Are you enjoying your life at the moment? You content with life? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm enjoying myself. I'm enjoying myself. You can't have a better life than I had. I, I, I mean, I, I, I kicked a lot of butt, you know, I didn't get hurt. You know, I, I have no 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 ailments from from being in the ring. You know, I, I'm I'm pretty good. I'm all right. I'm cool. I'm cool in the game. I'm happy to hear you I have say no that. Complaint. I'm happy to hear you say that, Michael. Um, do you watch the sport of boxing these days at all? Yeah, I, I watch whenever I can catch one, and then I watch that MMA and watch that crazy fight. But I watch it every now and again. And is there anyone that you're Not specific? The same. Yeah, it's not the same. No, I agree. Is there anyone that you're specifically into or a fan of these days? No, nobody in particular, no. Nobody in particular. Okay, Michael, um, before I let you go, I just want to give you an opportunity to, like, a message for any of your UK fans because there's a lot, a lot of guys over here that, that are big fans of, of yourself. Yeah, well, I can tell them what I did. What I, what I learned to do was to train hard, and you can get the best, the best out of your body. You don't train hard. You you you're setting yourself up for, for for default, not default, but you setting yourself up, up for not not doing so well in the ring. But when you care about yourself, you train hard, and you get the best out of your body. Yeah, and you'll absolutely. do well in the ring. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, listen, Michael, I know you like to stay out of the public eye and you don't do many interviews, so I really appreciate you giving us a bit of time this week. It's a real honour to speak to one of the best fighters to ever lace up the gloves. I wish you the best health and blessings for the future. Michael, thank you very much. You got it, man. Thank you much. Okay, now it's time to conclude episode 38 of the Box Hard Podcast. What a crazy show. We've brought you two guests on this week's show, as per usual. The first guest, Tom Doran, undefeated 17-0 and middleweight prospect. The second guest, the former Olympic gold medalist, former light heavyweight and heavyweight world champion, Michael Spinks. You just couldn't have dreamt it. These two names have absolutely nothing in common until today. They're both part of episode 38 on the Box Hard Podcast podcast no other podcast out there would have a lineup quite like this we often throw two spices in the pan together and see what comes of it and to be honest i think it's come out pretty damn good we started up the prediction league this week Ayaz is going to keep note of that i've gone for porter to win on points Ayaz went for Furman to win on points we're going to see who's in the lead come next week if you want to get involved in that just tweet us at Box Hard Podcast on Twitter. Give us any predictions that you've got for any upcoming fights and we'll read out your predictions on the air. As always, a massive thank you is owed to our listeners for making this show what it is. So on behalf of myself and I as Sumra, God bless and we'll see you next week. <laughs>